And so does that mean I have to use the microphone or just lean into? Yeah, you have to use a microphone. But you just have to speak directly into the top. Hello, welcome everybody to Wabanaki Voices at Ime Matthias. I'm Jennifer Isherwood, a Native American coordinator here at Ime Matthias Wabanaki Center in Orono. And I met Christiana through her wonderful parents who I work with um, for the DOE Wabanaki Studies website. Check it out sometime. Um, I'll let Christiana introduce herself because she's got a lot to say specifically, but we're just very happy that she could come. She's a wonderful artist and person and um, also works with the Abbey Museum as education um, curator. Welcome, Christiana. Thank you. <laughs> um, as she said, my name's Christiana Becker. I'm also a part of Penobscot Nation. I grew up on the reservation there and went to their K through eight school. Um, my college studies, I have what I call a pyramid of degrees. I have one master's, two bachelor's degrees, and three minors. So my master's of fine arts is in Intermedia from the University of Maine. And then I have a bachelor's of fine arts and studio art with a concentration in printmaking. And then I have a bachelor's of arts in art education. And then my minors are in art history, dance, and business administration. So that's a bit more about myself. <laughs> um, to get all those degrees and minors, I spent eight years in undergrad and four years getting my master's. So I have a lot of stuff to talk about, my education experience and how it related to my art practice. So I want to start with my thesis piece, which is on the screen. It's called Identity Belts. And before I talk about this specific piece, I want to start with showing you the inspiration that led to my thesis piece. So Identity Belt had first a sister piece that I created in 2019 called BIE Beatings, where I created a beating for every state that has a BIE or Bureau of Indian Education School per the BIE website. There were many design elements I needed to take on when I decided to create this piece. I needed to creatively problem solve how I was going to show the value of these uncommon schools. I made the decision that I needed to find a way to show that these schools exist. And in doing so, I wanted to show where BIE schools are in the United States, how many BIE schools are in each state, and how many indigenous students of North America are enrolled in each BIE school. So if you look on the screen, these beatings are uh, meant to make a map of the United States. So the one on the far right is actually Maine. And then at the very bottom, there's the one for Florida. So if you look, the East Coast has a very different <laughs> um, representation to the West Coast. There are only three states on the East Coast that have BIE schools, and they're Maine, North Carolina, and Florida. The states that have the most BIE schools are Arizona, New Mexico, and North and South Dakota. So these are some of my favorite beatings that came out from these pieces from this series. The one on the top left is Wisconsin. And then right next to it is for Michigan. The bottom left is for Maine. And the bottom right is for Oklahoma. So in order to show how many BIE schools are in each state, I ended up using different colors to represent each school. For instance, for Maine, which is in the bottom left, Maine has three BIE affiliated schools here. They're Indian Island School, Sabayak School, and Indian Township School. And all the beads used to create BIE beatings represents the number of indigenous students that go to BIE schools. Based on data from 2007 to 2008, the Bureau of Indian Education funded 183 elementary and secondary schools on 64 reservations in 23 states. In the year that this data was collected, approximately 42,000 Indigenous students were enrolled in Bureau-funded schools. 
Comparing these two photos shows the striking difference between a state that has two schools, Montana, and a school that has a state that has 45 schools, New Mexico. So one of the benefits of BEI schools, and I went to one, Indian Island School, is that the tribal council has say in the education. So it's more culturally enriching. I had classes that you won't typically have in public school. I had Native American studies, Penobscot language, and once a month we would go to the gym and drum, dance, and sing. So I was able to learn more about my culture from the school I attended. Here are some other close-ups of uh, the states, just for you folks virtually can have a good image of them. Um, upper left is South Dakota. Right next to it is Oregon. Bottom left is the state of California. And right next to it on the right is the state of Nevada. So going back, all of these beads, all of these beatings that I did, there's 23 of them to represent every state that has one in the United States. And all the beads is a one to run ratio of indigenous students that attend schools in that state. So in total, this series has roughly 42,000 beads. It took me about a year to create this piece. It was a lot of work. <laughs> in order to keep track of the amount of beads that I was using and how many of each color I was using, because each color is a different school, I kept tally marks and two bookmarks. <laughs> and one of the nice things about this is it was easy to travel with this series. I would just travel with my embroidery hoop, which held the felt and the beaded image in my notebook to keep up the tallies. And I would often be working on this series when I hung out with my friends and I would just bead as we watched TV and kept track of all the beads I was using. So the inspiration for Identity Belt, after I finished the BIE Beatings series, I set out to design a sister piece that would focus on the number of Indigenous students that go to public school and do not receive the same amount of care when it comes to cultural education. This sister piece became Identity Belt. After much research and creative contemplation on how to show someone searching for their identity, I came across the two row belt design. Two continuous parallel lines, an ongoing, an ongoing journey, and that's what I imagined a search for identity might be ongoing. That imagery stuck with me, and I started to map out changes to these unbroken parallel lines to reflect a feeling of navigating one's identity through a mixture of struggle, doubt, advice, and courage as a person ages. So the next few images are gonna show you mapping out designs on graph paper to these two parallel lines and how a pattern can change over time through progression. Um, in order to show a pattern of internal conflict, I altered the consistent two-row belt design to represent the struggle between navigating one's self-identity within the boundaries of these solid lines, as if they held one sense of self. With that in mind, I used the colors of the medicine wheel in my design to represent the four stages of one's life, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and the elderly. The color of the background, I wanted to stay consistent and decided for it to remain the color white, which symbols the time of the elderly and our ancestors. In my culture, we see our ancestors as always around us, guiding our path and offering us hidden wisdom, which is why I chose it to be the color that surrounds the parallel lines. To resemble the idea of navigating one's self-identity, white beads start to appear in the continuous repetition of the parallel lines, flooding one's identity with external factors of doubt and criticism, while also offering hidden guidance into the next stage of one's life. The color of the line starts with yellow for childhood, red for adolescence, and black for adulthood. The number of beads represented in this piece also represents the number of Indigenous students that go to public school. 
there are approximately 594,348 indigenous students that go to public schools in the United States. While the number of beads shows statistical importance, not all of the beads could be incorporated into the beading design of identity belt, but were shown off to the side, indicating that self-discovery is an ongoing journey. And here are the beads off to the side in an ash basket with a lid flowing out of the basket. And for any of you that are beaders, these beads are 10 by zero. They are seed beads and they are quite tiny. <laughs> and here is the full piece in total and me hanging it up off to the side. Um, this piece in length, I think came to about 14 inches when I was all finished. And the leather hide, it's deer hide, that's behind identity belt was sort of a last minute decision in the planning process. Once I finished with identity belt and I was installing it, I realized it really didn't pop off the white wall and it was really hard to see. And I was like, I got to put some color there. It blends too much of the wall and it's not striking enough. So I came up with the idea to put it against the background of deer hide. <clears throat> Here you're going to see some close up images of identity belt so you can see more of that white beaded pattern that is coming into those solid yellow lines. And then once the red um, beads start to emerge, that is signaling one shift from childhood into adolescence and someone um, shifting in their stage of life until the yellow beads completely disappear and the solid lines are now completely red. Those two pieces, BIE beatings and identity belt, felt like two of my greatest artistic achievements up to that point in my life. They both took probably a year and a half to create, so that was also a very long time. But it's not where I started. I started in 2010, initially enrolled in the art education undergraduate program at the University of Maine and started taking my foundations classes in the art, drawing one, drawing two, 2D design, um, which mainly focused on the principles and aesthetics of design, such as contrast, proportion, repetition, movement, balance, pattern, and much more. I was also taking art history, art ed, and general education classes that were required for my, ma my major. But it wasn't until, my fifth year in undergrad in 2015 that I felt confident enough to enter a piece of my artwork into the juried student art exhibition at the University of Maine. I've entered this piece. It's a collage of Xerox self-made patterns that was accepted and I was thrilled and shocked. <laughs> I did not think that this piece was going to get in, but it felt like my strongest piece that I had made up until that point. 2015 had a lot of other positives going on for me. It was the first time I took a printmaking class and I was encouraged by my printmaking professor to bring content to the artwork we were making. First professor that really challenged and pushed me to bring content to my work. I started thinking about things that are important to me, such as my family and my connection to my Penobscot heritage, culture, identity, and history. For the next few semesters and years, I ended up taking advanced levels of printmaking and continued to create woodblock relief prints of stories I remember being told during my Native Studies classes at Indian Island School growing up. So this piece shows a multi woodblock print of an illustration of a story called the monster frog sometimes as also referred to as water famine. 
Um, I'm going to try to summarize the story because if I go into storytelling mode, this is going to be way too long of a presentation. But the story goes that um, sometimes when you're talking about goose gob stories, it will be pronounced and spelled a little differently. So I am more used to saying goose gobe instead of goose gob. There's kind of this running joke that Penobscot people like to put the vowels at the ends of things, and that's totally true because we say willy winny as thank you instead of willy one. So I am going to use the word goose gobe, but occasionally it will also be called goose gob. So Guscabe saw that his people were dying and starving of thirst, and he asked his people, what is wrong? Why, why are you so parched? And, <laughs> and his people told him that monster frog stole all the water and was keeping it in his belly for himself and would not share. Guscabe went to monster frog and told him he must share the water with his people he cannot leave the people so starving. The water is meant to be shared with everyone. Monster frog refused, and Guscabe cut down a birch tree which fell on monster frog, flattening and killing him, and the water expelled from his mouth, creating the rivers, waters, tributaries, lakes, and ponds we have today. So this uh, multi-wood block was three wood blocks, so it is printed in three different colors. One block is red, one block is black, and one block is white. So the white one is the hardest to see, but sometimes if you look in the waves that are black, you can see a little makeout of a turtle and some fish that are swimming in the waves. The red block shows the people, and once the water expels from Monster Frog's mouth, they are so thirsty that they are jumping into the river and some of them start to turn into the fishes and turtles that now reside in that water. And the black block shows the frog, the expelling of water, and what um, I portrayed as Guscabe. I tend to portray people in my wood blocks as kind of nondescript because indigenous people all look different and I don't want my representations of people to be thought as a one dimensional portrayal of indigenous people. So I do a kind of a nondescript person. Um, this wood block, it is four wood blocks to create this big um, image. It is called first corn or first mother. And then this is another illustration of a story called Guscabe Captures All the Game Animals. On the left side is Guscabe tricking the animals into thinking that doomsday is coming and that the only way to survive is to jump into this game bag that his grandmother Woodchuck made of her own fur with grandmother Woodchuck at the bottom, um, Guscabe goes to show Grandmother Woodchuck all of the game animals he has captured, and she scolds him, saying that he is not doing well because he is not thinking of the generations that are coming after that will need this food and that it needs to be shared with everyone and can't all be hoarded for yourself. So Guscabe goes back into the woods and tells the game animals that doomsday is over and they may all go back into the woods and they jump out of the game bag. So in this image, I liked the parallel duality of animals jumping in and animals jumping out of the bag. And the word bubble with all the people inside of it is meant to be the generations that you're supposed to be thinking of and making sure that you are leaving food and resources for them in the future. So after many years of focusing on illustrating Penobscot stories that I heard growing up, I started focusing on social political issues that Indigenous people face. I created a screen print that focused on data that I found collected in 2013 that documented missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada 
At the time, I couldn't find data for the United States. So I worked with data that I could find in Canada. The cases were divided into four categories, one for murder, two for missing, suspicious death, and unknown. In order to visually show each of the four categories, I drew a repeated dress pattern in Photoshop and separated it into four layers, one for each of the four cases. The layer on the left is for murder cases. The photo on the right is for unknown cases. Then the slide on this left is for missing cases. And the right shows all the layers printed together. And if you look really closely, there is a white dot pattern of a woman's face that you can make out when all layers are printed together. It's kind of hard to see on the screen, but if you see my mouse, this is an eye. This is another eye. Here is the nose. Here are the lips. And here is the hair all about. So I went back to carving wood blocks. This is the largest wood block I have ever carved. It is 42 by 60 inches. It depicts protests that were happening related to the Dakota Access Pipeline. At the bottom, you see protesters holding signs. You see guardsmen with dogs. Behind them, you see someone being arrested. You see the popular slogan that was often repeated of water equals life. You also see the pipeline being built in the background. And for, at the time, people's fears that eventually became true, the pipeline leaking into their water. So after spending eight years obtaining my double bachelor's degrees and three minors and graduating with them. I decided I wanted to continue my studies and apply for a master's of fine arts degree in printmaking so that I could teach art at the college level. I also wanted to try to get into a master's program that is known for its arts programming and had a printmaking facility that I was looking for. I ended up applying to five universities and was offered enrollments at Tufts and Virginia Commonwealth University, or VCU, Masters of Fine Arts Painting and Printmaking program. I ended up touring VCU and fell in love with all the different art classes they had to offer. I also liked the setting of the area and how different it was from where I grew up in Old Town, Maine. The other positive of VCU is that the first year's tuition was free, but we still had to pay the additional fees. And as I was also offered a graduate teaching assistantship in the printmaking and painting classroom, which is actually what I wanted, experience teaching at the college level. So I ended up attending VCU. This is one of the pieces that I ended up creating at VCU. In my second semester, I took a glass blowing class, which was really cool and not what I thought I was going to be doing, because if you notice from all my other images, none of them were sculptural. <laughs> so it is quite a bit harder for me to think in a 3D format. But I wanted to challenge myself and to use glass as a way to talk about how blood quantum is fragile. So in this piece, you can't really see it, but the top printed page it shows my grandfather's Penobscot tribal ID, and the middle shows my father's. And for mine, I do not have a tribal ID because my nation has um, a blood quantum percentage that for you to be a member or citizen of Penobscot nation, you must have 25% of Penobscot blood or more. So my dad and his siblings are the last folks in my family who meet that threshold point, I am unfortunately at 18%. So I am seven drops of blood away from meeting that threshold. So I wanted to really talk about how that can be a struggle as someone who grew up and went to school on the reservation, 
but who cannot but access the same rights and benefits and as someone who is a member or citizen. I also wanted to reference that when someone asks me how native are you, they're really asking for my blood quantum. And so to create this piece, I ended up creating 18 blood droplets, my blood quantum percentage, and put them in the area of the printed tribal IDs and created fake blood to write the question, how native are you? Um, when I had the critique of this place, this piece, um, it wasn't as super well received by my um, colleagues and my professor. Some folks felt that the blood droplets shouldn't be on the floor, that the pages of printed tribal IDs should be um, laid out in a different format, and that the writing of how native are you in fake blood was a little gory. <laughs> so I went back to the drawing board and tried to figure out a different way to talk about blood quantum in my family. So the next three pieces of work are going to be work I created at VCU, and they were at my end of the year candidacy show. So again, I'm referencing my family's blood quantum. On the left is the blood quantum for my grandfather. In the middle is the blood quantum for my father. And then on the right is my blood quantum. So I laid it out in the pattern of a person to show the regression in my family line of how it's becoming less and less, and you seem to be less and less of a person. So the next few slides are going to show some close-ups of these blood droplets. Um, I should also note, because this was my first time taking a glass blowing class, I could not work with colored glass. So to mimic the color of blood, I used alcohol paint so that it could still have that nice translucidness that glass has. Because if you were to use acrylic paint, it would be matte and it wouldn't have the same sort of glass properties that I was looking for. <laughs> These next few slides show a wheat paste and mural that I created during my studies at VCU. I first printed 500 pages worth of the application you have to fill out to get a Penobscot Nation tribal ID. And on the application, I screen printed rights that descendants of Penobscot Nation don't have if they don't meet the blood quantum threshold of 25%. Some of these things are not being able to vote on the tribal chief, not being able to live on the reservation, not being able to hunt on tribal land, and more. Lastly, I made a glass mold of a medicine wheel and wrapped embroidery thread to add color to it. I then hung it from the ceiling so that you could look up at it while the embroidery thread encompasses you. Uh, as I said earlier, these three pieces, the blood droplets, the wheat pasted wall, and the medicine wheel were all in my candidacy so, which is the big important thing at the end of your year of study at VCU. After struggling the whole year with my art critiques, getting the messaging and importance of my art across, and hearing from my committee at the end of my candidacy show, that I was the sole person in my cohort to receive an incomplete and would need to redo my show over the summer with a piece of new artwork, I had a crucial decision to make. Do I stay here or do I consider moving back to Maine and trying to transfer back to the University of Maine? I decided to transfer back to the University of Maine where I felt like my artwork would be better understood and supported. The next several slides will show you work that I created during my master's program at the University of Maine. I went back to what felt familiar and made an illustration to a story I read from the book, The Life and Traditions of the Red Man by Joseph Nicklor, 
which was part of my reading material for the Native American folklore class that I was taking at the University of Maine. This image shows you the wood block that I was carving for the print. And then this image shows you the printed piece. So I changed up a little bit of my methods with this print. Instead of printing it on paper, I printed it on fabric, and then I embroidered certain elements of the story. So in this story, I'm also going to summarize it for time. Guscabe is on a voyage to clear the waters of debris and encounters a monster serpent. They fight, and a woodpecker comes to Guscabe's aid, showing him where the snake's weakness is the tip of his tail, which is why Woodpecker is pointing to it with his beak. It then takes till the seventh arrow for the monster serpent to be slain. And if you can see on the image, it is the seven arrows that I embroidered. It is then this image that shows the monster serpent's defeat. And as a mark of friendship, Guscabe dips an arrow into the snake's pooling blood and places it on Woodpecker's head, making it the red Woodpecker we know today. I then moved on to decide to carve the four sacred medicines. The left print is tobacco, the middle is sweet grass, and the right print is for sage. I didn't carve the fourth one, cedar, until the following semester, which you will see later. I ended up hanging these prints at the backside of my family's camp, which resides on Twin Lake in Millinocket. And from the back of the island, you can see Mount Katahdin in the background. The next couple of slides will show you the carved plates from these sacred medicines so that you can see the process. Um, instead of carving wood, which I was more used to doing, I was carving linoleum, which is much easier on your wrists. <laughs> My end goal was to use these carved plates to create a book about the four sacred medicines. And here you can see the plate for cedar, and in the next slide you will see it printed. However, in wanting to create a book, I didn't know how, and New Maine didn't offer a bookmaking class. But the University of Southern Maine did, and with them being sister schools, I ended up taking the bookmaking class virtually and learned how to make books. And here is the end result of that Four Sacred Medicines book that I created. I wanted to continue this exploration into using the Four Sacred Medicines as a theme. And I ended up taking a textiles class where I created small sewn vessels that had plant materials from each medicine and a color of fabric to match the medicine wheel. The yellow vessel has tobacco, the red has sweetgrass, the black has sage, and the white has cedar. In order to create these vessels, you had to use a sewing machine and a dissolvable plastic called Solvi. You had to sandwich the materials into the plastic and carve a web matrix around them so that once you dissolve the solvi in water, the sewn thread keeps all the materials together. And while the solvi is dissolving, it starts to feel gluey and sticky in your hands. And you can wrap the thread of materials around an object and let it harden and dry for 24 hours. And then once you pop it off, it will hold its shape like these vessels here. One of the other big endeavors I dedicated myself to after taking that textiles class was making a quilt. This was the first quilt I have ever made, and it was not something we spent time on in my um, textiles class. That was really the basics of how to use a sewing machine, how to change the bobbin, how to thread the thread, how to push the pedal, all of those things. So to teach myself how to make a quilt, I watched YouTube videos and then set out to make my own. And I gotta say, I think I did a pretty good job. Those corners are pretty on point. 
And I also wanted to follow in some of my grandmother's footsteps because they were both quilt makers and one of them would also make granny square blankets. The colors and patterns of this fabric was also created by me. The blue fabric was created by me developing sienna types on fabric from photographs that I took on hikes with my partner. The hikes were taken in areas of Maine that relate back to the first moose hunt story. I remember being told as a child where Guscave chases a moose and a calf around the state of Maine until they are successful in their hunt. We ended up hiking trails in Islesboro, Brooksville, Castine, Big Spencer Mountain, and Mount Kineo. I also incorporated eco-printed fabric for the remaining squares. And on the slide are some images of that eco-printed fabric before I cut it into four by four squares for my quilts. And I have to say, I will never do four by four squares again. <laughs> there is a big reason why, if you look on the internet, they recommend five by five or eight by eight squares. And I was not accounting for the seam allowance margin of sewing pieces together. So they more turned out as three by five squares. <laughs> and I think I probably a cut out like 400 squares and I wanted it to be the length of our queen bed but right now it only really sits on the top of it and has no <laughs> overhang so I have to go back and add into this quilt before it is fully finished right now it's still just a top quilt so what have I been doing since college since this 12 years in college. So this image also shows my thesis show of all of us hanging up our work and looking at it before it's open to the public. I have created a logo for a UK skincare company called Hickles. They asked me if I could create a logo that incorporated seaweed as the gift box that was rolling out has seaweed as a component in the skincare. And I asked them if it would be okay if I incorporated the Penobscot word for seaweed in the image or if that would mess with their branding. But they said that was fine. And here was the end result of that logo on the box. It was great working with them and that they were supporting a charity called Changing Faces, which supports anybody with a scar, mark, or condition on their body or face that makes them look different. They provide advice, support, and psychosocial services to children, young people, and adults. They challenge discrimination and campaign for face equality a world that truly values and respects people who look different. I also created a logo for a family friend, Shanna Fisher Mackey, who started a doula business called Little Fish. In my spare time, I create beaded bracelets, which I sell and give away as gifts. And this led me to give a beating demonstration to the Colby College Art Museum's Fall Open House last September. Well, this is great. Perfect. <laughs> 15 minutes for questions. That was the end of my presentation. So yeah, that's kind of a brief rundown of my 12 years in college, getting my pyramid of degrees. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, if anybody has questions, we'd love to have you speak into the microphone. Does anybody have questions? I'll start. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, how do you come up with some of the ideas for the, you know, the medium and the structure of your art pieces? Do you love it? Yeah. Um, so when I was first an undergrad, I mainly just created printmaking works because that was my concentration. But there's a lot of different things you can do with printmaking. You can do 
woodblock relief prints, you can do intaglio comber print uh, printing, you can do screen printing, you can do lithography, you can do monotype printing. So one of the things I really liked about printmaking was all the different techniques you have so that depending on the information I wanted to convey, sometimes I would think about what technique is best. Mm -hmm. Like for printing the, um, the red dress for the missing and murdered indigenous women, that would have potentially be a lot harder to create out of a wood block where I have to carve all of the dresses. And then I would have had to do it if I wanted it to be the four layers. I would have had to carve four separate ones and that seemed like way too much than rather creating it on photoshop separating it into layers and then screen printing it so sometimes it has to do with the techniques of which one is going to lend itself easier to the message i'm trying to convey um, with the beading pieces i at the time wanted to focus on more traditional arts so I was trying tradition as in like my cultural tradition, not as in like artistic tradition. But so I decided that I wanted it to be in beading form. And I was like, how can I do this in beading form? And then I start with thinking, OK, what is the information I want to convey? I want to convey where they are so I can do a beading for each state. Well, how can I try to create a legend of like this with a map, but an artistic legend? So that's when the idea came that each school would be its own color. And then I decided I would use as many beads as there are indigenous students that go to BIE schools. So it is a lot of thought and research before I actually get to the art creation piece. Um, and when I was creating BIE beatings, when I was thinking of the um, pattern or the image for each state, I would look up tribal nations in that state and see if they had tribal flags or any sort of image that I could try to replicate. Um, that didn't work for all of them, but it worked for some of them. Um, North Carolina is part of their flag, Oklahoma is. New Mexico is, um, but some of them, like in Maine, I'm used to hearing the term the rising dawn as we are the first state to see the sun. So I, for Maine, used the idea of the rising dawn and did a sun with waves and then double curves at the bottom. The hardest thing about the BIE beating piece was because I only used as many beads as indigenous students that go to BIE schools there, that meant I wouldn't be able to do the full design. For states that only had beads within the hundreds, I only drew like the briefest outline of a design because I was like, I can only use 80 beads. This isn't gonna be that complete. It's going to look purposely unfinished, which is what I wanted. Yeah. Oh, I don't. I don't know. The people on Zoom won't be able to hear you. Oh, there's people on Zoom. Yeah. Oh, I, see. I didn't realize. Um, yeah, I'm just. Um, I was really moved um, a lot by the, by the. I think you called it the quantum blood. Mm -hmm. Um, that relationship and just sensing some of uh, your suffering in, in that and. I'm just, I guess my curiosity is like, um, can you speak to um, where you find hope in, in um, like what can uh, come into maybe the human soul or spirit if the blood, you mm -hmm. have such a strong spirit mm -hmm. in native spirit, um, but then, the 18 percent blood and so i just want would like you to speak to that um to that struggle that sure you, yeah, yeah. um Thank you. so i didn't struggle with it as much as a kid because we didn't really talk about it as kids um going to indian island school we knew that all the students there were indigenous or were native 
but we never really asked each other like are you on the census what's your blood quantum <laughs> like <laughs> that really didn't play effect until i got older and became a, a legal adult <laughs> and so there are certain things because i'm a what's called a first generation descendant that i get versus if i was more far removed so i was still able to get the um native american waiver at the university of maine which makes your tuition free my dad had to go with me to give the paperwork to verify that he is on the census, which means I'm a first generation away from someone who is on my nation census. Um, it does create struggle in that mostly the things that I mentioned earlier that I wish I could do where I could vote on the tribal chief, um, could live on the reservation, because I did live on the reservation from the age of four to 13 <laughs> growing up. But if uh, something was to horribly happen to my dad, like let's say he was to die when we were living on the reservation, we couldn't live in our home anymore because he was our connection to being a member. So let's see, when I became an adult, it kind of became more clear to me that I had to learn how to navigate being a descendant and what I could and couldn't do. And while there is struggle with blood quantum, the reason why it is in place is if, um, and this is my understanding of it, there could be other things in play that I just don't know because I've never worked for tribal governments. But um, if a tribal nation adopts a blood quantum law for citizenship or membership, they are given um, money from the federal government to help with uh, funding education, the health clinic, um, able to give per capita checks to the community and members, citizens. Um, but usually it is communities, tribal communities that are smaller that have a blood quantum because they're more residential. Penobscot Nation is a very residential reservation. So it doesn't have as many businesses to keep a town afloat, to have that revenue and income for a town from the businesses that you have. But if you were to go out west where um, there are much larger tribal nations like Lakota, Diné, out in New Mexico and Arizona area, they don't have blood quantums because they have so much bigger reservation and land that they're able to get that revenue from their own businesses. So um, I know I'm mainly talking about Penobscot Nation, but there are over 500 federally recognized nations in the United States. So they're all different. Some of them have blood quantum, some of them don't. Um, so it just kind of depends which one you're talking about. So I can empathize why my nation has one to try to keep the community afloat and get that money that they need because you can't really grow on an island. <laughs> it's only so big. Um, but it unfortunately, having a blood quantum does create alienation between member citizens and descendants. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of this. And um, I'm curious what, like how you got into art and maybe who your mentors were or if you had any and what your inspirations were to yeah. pursue that. Um, so graduating from high school, I so I went to Indian Island K through eight. I went to Old Town High. I always took art classes. I took AP art in high school. I always loved my art teachers. They were always the classroom I wanted to go to. I also come from a family of educators. My mom's a second grade teacher. My dad's an ed tech. And my grandmother was a third grade teacher and then did reading recovery and now um, works with student teachers. So I come from a family of educators and my parents would always help me with, um, with studying, with my homework, and I just 
always wanted to be an educator. And when I thought of what I wanted to teach, it was automatically art. I was like, this is going to be the most fun subject. This is where kids go often when they're just needing like either a quiet space or a place to create. And that's what I wanted to be. It wasn't until really my fifth year in college that I felt confident enough about my art. And I decided to get a dual degree because I initially went in for just art education. And I think it wasn't until my fifth year that I told my advisor, I want to double degree. I want art and art education. So then while I was at the University of Maine, my printmaking teacher that encouraged me the most, her name is Susan Gross. Um, she has a very long CV in printmaking and she was always giving me encouragement, always um, was really supportive of the artwork I was creating about my Penobscot identity. And that's what helped me also pursue it further. And where I started um, illustrating Penobscot stories, it wasn't until probably the year after that I really started exploring those social political issues that were going on. And I wanted to bring more of a lens to issues that are important to Indigenous people or Indigenous nations that they're fighting for and less about the stories. So I would kind of switch back and forth from doing um, stuff that was more heavy and social political. And once you kind of go and do a lot of stuff that's social political, you need a little like break to recuperate and do something that's um, not as intense. So I would kind of switch back from doing social political work and then just focus on pattern making and illustrating and then kind of go back into social political work so I could give myself that break and that recuperation and able to kind of like de-stress. Um, and then once I went to VCU, that was kind of the hardest. It was, you know, a way from everything that I knew, away from my friends, my family, my Penobscot community. And I slowly realized that my art really wasn't understood <laughs> at Virginia. And I was really struggling to get my message across, not only to my peers, but also the professors. And it felt like there was almost this lack of being able to understand. Um, for reference, the um, medicine wheel piece, I'm going to find it. So this piece, when I was having my critique with this medicine wheel, and the critique was about an hour long, <laughs> um, one of the professors just kept asking, why is it this four colors? And I could explain like what the colors meant, how they reference uh, a sacred medicine, how they relate to a four stage of life. They also relate to a cardinal direction, but I had no story or reference or information of why it's black, yellow, white, and red versus blue, brown, purple, and orange. I was like, it's just is. Like, I don't know the answer to this. I don't even know like the answers to like, why flags are there certain color? Like there's just some information we don't know. But um, that was kind of the struggle is it felt like I needed to know the answer to everything. And there was some sort of like vibes of tokenism going on that I didn't like or agree with. And then after my candidacy show, when it came to a head of you have an incomplete, you must do everything over. I kind of reached my threshold of struggling <laughs> and was like, if I stay here, the second year is not free. I think it would have been like 50,000 something dollars to stay at a school that I was struggling and not feeling supported at. So I decided to come back home where I knew that more of the audience here in Maine understands the work that I'm working on. It's more supported by professors that I've already worked with at the University of Maine. So I talked with them and it was very easy just transfer and to finish my graduate studies. Fortunately, not all of my credits transferred. So it was only like 
nine of them and I took like a whole year of classes. So instead of doing um, the University of Maine is a three year program for a master's in intermedia, I still had to do those three years. It wasn't cut to just only doing two. But I was like, I'd much rather spend three years at the University of Maine than one more year at VCU struggling, potentially being failed. <laughs> Because if I redid my art show and redid my candidacy show of that incomplete, there was always that fear of what if I'm failed here and then what do I do from there? And during my graduate studies, it was Susan Smith, who was the uh, chair of my committee and was my big advocate for my master's program. Your mom just looks like it's <laughs> I'm glad to hear she that. Should be. Mom should be very proud. Um, I want to say just that I loved your first take on your artwork, and I did not think that it needed to be de uh, redone. Um, <laughs> well, thank yeah. you. Sometimes to get your point across in different ways, it needs to be a little. Sometimes you just need a different audience. <laughs> You do. So I think you made the right choice. Um, not that I didn't love everything that you did afterwards when you rethought it, but I thought that you definitely got your point across um, in the first piece. And I thought it was a nice mix of kind of just a more a simple piece with the printings mm -hmm. and then really taking the next steps to add mm -hmm. the other pieces. So this um, one? Yes. I think that's pretty clear. <laughs> and <laughs> um, yeah, I quite like it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people aren't ready to see things in a certain way. So I think you should be proud of that and the work that you did afterwards. Mm -hmm. So if nobody else has any questions, we will stuff. wrap it up. This will be on our Wabnaki Voices series um, playlist on our YouTube. And I hope to have that up by the first of the week. Um, and that will be on there with closed captioning and such. So once it's on there, feel free to share it with whoever you yeah. wish. Put it wherever you want. Uh. Oh, I have a, one other comment for you. When you asked me about blood quantum, I just remembered this. So when I am talking about myself and my Penobscot identity, because I cannot actually fully enroll, I have to make sure I'm not saying I'm a member or I'm a citizen. Instead, I say I'm a part of Penobscot Nation or I say I'm a descendant of Penobscot Nation. So there's not that confusion and I'm not like misidentifying myself. <laughs> um, but there are also certain things um, related to the arts that I also can't do. There is um, I forget what year it was made, but there's a Native American arts and crafts law that if you're going to sell your artwork and say it's Native American made, that you must be a citizen or member of your nation. It was a law, I think, created in the 1990s, and it was meant to help prevent forgeries being created. A lot of non-Indigenous folks were creating artwork claiming it was Native made when they weren't actually Indigenous themselves. So it was meant to be a law to kind of prevent that forgery and misinformation of selling, but unfortunately it does create a barrier where descendants can't market their artwork in the same way. So I'm trying to figure out how to market myself as a Penobscot artist without using those words of like member or citizen. So instead I might call myself like a um, Penobscot descendant maid or something like that. Or I might say I'm, um, it is indigenous made instead of saying it's native made, trying to skirt around that wording. Mm -hmm. thank, you so much. thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. It. It was wonderful. All right, goodbye, buddy. Thank you. Can I close this? Yes. Okay. <laughs>